Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's program with Laura Mitchell. Before we get started, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of a couple of our upcoming events. Uh, on December 1st, we have Mahjong, a Chinese, Amer Chinese game and the making of American culture with Annalise Hines at 7 p.m. And then to kick off our 2022 programming, we have a special three-part series in January, Friends and Allies with Greg Zipes. And a little new note uh, in the future, you'll see this on our programs, we are now supported by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. This evening, we have with us Laura Mitchell, a historic architect, project architect, and team lead with Kramer Design Group. Um, she has a lot of experience with rehabilitating and renovating buildings. Um, and we'll be speaking about one of her most recent projects, the Detroit Pre Press Building. At this time, I am going to turn everything over to Laura Mitchell. And just a reminder that if you have any questions, I'm happy to moderate a question answer session after the present presenter is finished. If you could submit any questions via the chat feature, that would be great. And I hand it over now to Laura Mitchell. Thank you. It, sorry, I'm trying to get my screen to share, but it says that participant screen sharing is disabled. Just one second, let me Thank you. get that fixed. It's not giving me all of the options, just one second. There you go. Here we go. All right. Uh, welcome to Hat Off the Press, Connecting Buildings and People Through Preservation at the Detroit Free Press Building. Um, quick overview of the presentation. We'll start with locating the building downtown and do an overview of the history of the building. And then we'll take a virtual tour, starting with the exterior, moving into the basement, and then working our way up, looking at a mix of historic photographs, photographs from 2017 prior to renovation starting, and photographs from 2021 after the renovations were completed. And mixed in with all of this will be some memories that were shared from former Detroit Free Press employees who worked on this building. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm Laura Mitchell. I've been an architect with Kramer Design Group for the last nine, almost 10 years now, um, and have been working on the Detroit Free Press building since the renovations began in 2017. Um, it's been kind of one of my bigger projects for the last several years here. It's been a really large project with a large project team. So a quick shout out to everyone who's been involved um, and had a piece in pulling this all together. So starting with some context um, for where the Detroit Free Press Building is located within Detroit, highlighted in orange on the map on the left, it's located at the edge of downtown Detroit on West Lafayette Boulevard. Um, there's a few other Detroit landmarks called out in blue for context, Capitol Park, the Hudson site, um, Campus Martius and Woodward. And then the map on the right highlights the building in orange, which occupies half a city block. It faces West Lafayette Boulevard and is located between Cast Avenue and Washington. Um, and a few photos along the bottom, just highlighting the exterior of the building after renovations. Brief history of the building. Um, the Detroit Free Press building was designed by Albert Kahn and built in 1924 to house the Detroit Free Press newspaper operations. It has an unusual layout with a rectangular footprint at the first three stories, two light courts along the alley, which would give floors four through six E-shaped layouts, and a tower centered on the building at floors seven through 14. The Detroit Free Press operated out of this building for nearly 75 years, and it served as the in-house production facility for the newspaper. So all operations involved in the production of the newspaper happened in this building, from writing to editing to printing, wrapping, labeling, bundling, and loading papers into the delivery trucks in the alley. 
Um, the tower portion of the building was designed as speculative commercial office space and was occupied by various smaller professional firms. In 1979, printing operations were relocated to a Detroit Riverfront location. And by 1998, the paper had entered a joint operating agreement with the Detroit News, and the operations of both newspapers were consolidated into the Detroit News building down the street. The Detroit Free Press building then remained vacant from 1998 until the renovations began in 2017. A little bit more information on Albert Kahn. Um, the Detroit Free Press building was designed by Albert Kahn, who is a actually pretty famous Detroit and Michigan architect. He was a Jewish German immigrant um, and was one of Detroit's most prolific architects. He was born in 1869 near Frankfurt, Germany and immigrated to Detroit in 1881. Um, he was the oldest of eight children with the family photo there on the left and had to leave formal schooling in the seventh grade to help support his family. Um, his talent for artistry was noticed and he worked for George D. Mason, um, another architect where he learned drafting before eventually starting his own firm in 1895. He partnered with his brother, Julius Kahn, who was a civil engineer and they created the first firm in Detroit to offer both architectural and engineering services. And together they invented and patented the Kahn system of reinforced concrete. The system was used primarily in factories, but a version with metal pans is prevalent in commercial buildings throughout Detroit, um, including the Detroit Free Press building. So you can actually see it on the lower uh, left there. You can see the metal pan structure. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the stripes in the light tan um, is the concrete coming down between the joists and then the dark part is actually little upside down U-shaped metal pans um, in between the structural concrete. We actually see that all over the place in Detroit. Um, so it's pretty fun to see it exposed like that. And Albert Kahn played a large role shaping the architecture of both Detroit and the United States. And his firm was known and caught the attention of Henry Ford for using lean principles and standardized details, which created efficient and quick drawings and construction. So looking at the building um, and how it's been occupied in different periods, um, showing use per floor. In 1924, um, the basement and sub-basement were both used for press operations. The first floor was retail along the front and press operations at the alley. Um, the free press offices were located on the second and third floors and floors four through 13 were built as speculative office for smaller firms. And they house a whole variety of professional offices. Um, then the 14th floor primarily housed building equipment. These divisions actually remain largely intact after the renovations, but the uses have changed slightly. Um, the basement and sub-basement is now home to tenant parking with retail spaces that are white boxed ready for tenants on the first floor. Um, the second and third floors have also been white boxed for future office tenants. And then floors four through 13 are built out into residential units with the 14th floor being used for building equipment and residential amenities. Um, just looking at a few historic photos here with a memory from Rick Sylvain, the Free Press building holds so many memories for those of us who worked there. It is an architectural gem. How heartwarming to know it was spared the fate that often befalls buildings left vacant and abandoned, but for the way back memories. Um, and then another memory from Rick Sylvain, the Free Press building had the look, feel, and heart of the Daily Planet. No newspaper building looked quite like it did. To the hard-bitten city desk journalists on the third floor, Features was the toy department. We shared the same passion to make the Detroit Free Press the best it could be, and also to kick the butt of the Detroit News in that charmless square mausoleum down the street. Um, and then just a before and after of the exterior here with the 2017 condition on the left, and then Post renovations 2021 on the right. Um, then looking on Cass Avenue, an additional interesting feature of this building, um, the, in the original design, space was actually included within the Detroit Free Press building for the Detroit Club, um, which is an elite social organization whose 1891 building stands immediately to the south. 
Uh, and there was even a separate entrance for the Detroit Club that was built within the Free Press building on Cass Avenue, along with meeting rooms and some private member rooms in the West Wing of the fourth and fifth floors. Um, so we have a historic photo on the left and then a photo from 2017 on the right, um, just pretty much the same condition today. That bridge still remains. Um, however, it's walled off at the Detroit Free Press building, so there's no longer a connection between the two properties. Then looking at um, a little closer at some of the exterior renovation details, um, the, on the left, we have a photo of the main building entrance on West Lafayette at 1924. Um, in the middle is the condition of the main entrance in 2017. And then the right shows the main building entrance today after renovations. Um, all of the original framing was actually remaining under that stainless steel. Um, and we were able to salvage and repaint it, which was really fantastic. Um, the doors and the glazing did have to be replaced, um, but we were able to blend them with the original historic materials. Okay, and just zooming in a little bit closer um, at the main entrance with the 2017 on the left and 2021 on the right, um, and you can kind of see that the doors look a little bit newer, um, but all of that dark bronze is um, original historic materials that we were able to salvage. And then looking at two of the storefront bays, um, 2017 on the left and 2021 on the right. Um, they had, the storefronts had been heavily modified over time and the original cast iron framing was heavily damaged in a lot of places missing altogether. Um, we salvaged what we could of the remaining cast iron framing and then used it to create molds for areas that were missing or damaged beyond repair. Um, and then the new and old framing was melded together to create a seamless rehabilitated storefront frame. And just taking a little closer look at what remained in 2017 on the left um, in its really sad condition and in 2021 um, how it looks restored and pieced back together. Um, the crown molding at the top there, this bit had been um, completely missing. So that was actually recreated based on historic drawings. And um, exterior memory here, a couple of people shared this one about the day that Neil Schein retired. Um, probably everyone will tell you about the day Neil Schein retired. Bill, M Bill Mitchell had his office, including a working phone, set up on the sidewalk outside the building, and they arranged for a police officer to come by and give him a ticket for littering. Uh, Dolly Cats. And then the De Detroit Free Press housed the most wonderful collection of talented, distinguished, and funny people I've ever met. They loved a good prank. One favorite memory was when managing editor Neil Shine retired yet again. Up to then, he kept coming back. So a group arranged to have his desk hauled out to the sidewalk in front of the building with a working landline phone. He conducted his final day of business there from Pat and Stet Kiska. Uh, moving to the inside of the building, start with the lower, lowest level of the sub-basement. So this is where the original press equipment was housed. Um, it's an incredibly large open space that's two stories tall um, the, with the 2017 condition on the left there and then the 2020 condition on the right um, prepped for parking um, to go in. Uh, look at some of the press equipment. So we have some historic photos here of the equipment that was originally housed in the basement and sub-basement. Um, from Marianne George, I remember the way the building would rumble when the presses started up in the basement about 6 p.m. It was a very powerful moment when you could literally feel the power of the press and know they were printing your story along with dozens of others. The um, original press room, which is the name given to the double height area of the sub-basement, cost $1 million to build in 1924. The press room contained 25 Goss high-speed press units that had the capacity to print and fold 504,000 16-page papers in one hour. Um, the building foundations were designed and constructed to allow an additional 38 press units to be installed in the future. It has some incredibly robust foundations um, with a picture of what those looked like on the lower left. And then there's one picture in the upper right there of the little bit of equipment that remained in 2017 
um, when we first went in the building. Um, the press room also contained one large 12 cylinder press, which was a multicolor press capable of printing 25,000 eight page comics and 12 page magazines in four hours, in four colors per hour. There's a lot of numbers <laughs> for the Sunday paper. Um, the 12 cylinder press was the length of the entire block and was designed to later be expanded up to 24 cylinders, thereby doubling its capacity. Um, and it's the the upper right photo, unknown remnant of equipment, and then a conveyor system took the printed papers directly from the press to the mailroom on the first floor where they were then prepared for delivery and distribution. We have a few fun finds from the basement and sub-basement. As you can imagine, there is some interesting stuff down there when we first went in the um, building and it was abandoned. Uh, the upper left is part of the equipment track that lined the edge of the double height space at the basement floor level. Um, on the lower left, we have a cart that is on sub-basement level tracks. There were several carts like this scattered throughout the sub-basement, all thoroughly rusted to the tracks, which is why that photo is incredibly orange. Um, it's from all of the rust. The middle, port the middle photo is a portion of a track that remains in the basement floor. And most of these tracks were actually left in place during renovations. We didn't um, take them out. We didn't infill them or anything. So they just kind of run through the space, which I always think is really fun when that happens. Um, so you can see a portion of a different track on the lower right photo in the renovated building uh, basement area. Then the upper right is a mysterious pile of something on the sub-basement floor. There were a lot of these scattered throughout the sub-basement and to this day, I have no idea what it was. It was soft and squishy and disgusting and I just kept my distance. But we were kind of fascinated by the kind of concave appearance of them. Uh, looking at the automated parking. So the sub-basement double height space was really hard to find a tenant and use for um, today. And there's no operating printing press. So it's old use was kind of obsolete. Um, so it's actually being renovated into an automated parking garage for tenants. And it will be the first fully automated parking system in the Midwest and will provide spaces for up to 105 vehicles. Uh, vehicles can be retrieved in 40 to 180 seconds. And it actually makes really efficient use of the large tall space. Um, then it's just interesting that we ended up with a use down there that was so similar with the large equipment um, similar to the press equipment that was originally in the basement and sub-basement. Uh, photos show the sub-basement double height space from both the sub-basement and basement levels in 2017 on the left, and then the sub-basement prior to installing parking in 2020 and the steel support structure um, while being installed in 2021. Moving up to the first floor, um, the place was cavernous and soaked with history. You could almost see the ghosts of guys with fedoras, I wore them myself, running out to cover the news in an exciting teeming city of 2 million people, which was Detroit's population in the early 1950s from Jeff Garrett. We have photos showing the lobby when the building opened in 1924 on the top left, the condition when work started in 2017 on the bottom left and the rehabilitated lobby in 2021 on the right. And then looking at some of the details, um, we have the first floor lobby ceiling, um, which involved a decent amount of repair work. We have the overall ceiling in 2017 on the left and the renovated ceiling in the middle um, with then a zoomed in image of a non-historic ceiling fan where light fixtures were originally. Um, on the upper right with um, an image of the historic replica lights on the lower right, um, which were custom designed based on the historic photo on the previous slide. The ceiling was repaired where plaster had been damaged and paint was touched up where it was flaking or missing. Um, there's a fair amount of work, but not actually as much as you often do see in these sorts of lobbies. I came to the Detroit Free Press from the Green Bay Press Gazette and felt like I had come home. As a journalist, I got better the moment I walked in the door. Suddenly, I was part of a long and storied tradition. I knew I had to step up my game. I lived just three blocks away at the Riverfront Towers. I walked to work every day or took the people mover. When I first moved to Detroit, 
downtown was a ghost town, but on the on the weekends, but it was beautiful. Um, also from Jeff Garrett. So a couple of the typical interior storefront bays that are in the lobby and the main lobby entrance on um, as seen from the lobby instead of from the exterior um, on the right there with the 2017 versions on the top and the renovated versions on the bottom. Then just some additional photos of some of the restoration work that happened in the lobby. The close up of a single elevator bay from 2017 on the left and from um, renovated in 2021 in the middle. And then the main doors that lead to the rest of the building from the lobby along with the adjacent elevators um, shown in 2017 on the upper right and 2021 on the bottom right. So much like um, the main entry doors on the exterior, the original cast iron decorative elevator surrounds were actually found intact below the non-historic stainless steel covers. So that was really exciting to find as a historic architect. Um, the new elevator doors were added to match the surrounds along with some new marble panels above the elevators and new lights above each elevator, which were designed based on the historic lobby photo. I was 17 years travel editor of the Free Press. Even though that beat often took me to faraway places, home was always walking back into the gilded lobby at 321 West Lafayette from Rick Selvain. Uh, just a couple photos of the elevator surrounds and the lights, and then a detail shot of the main ceiling lights, um, the historic replicas. Now we move back into the mailing room, um, which is highlighted in orange in the first floor plan in the lower right corner there. Um, it was located off of the alley on the first floor, and this is where newspapers were packaged and loaded into delivery trucks. Um, the floor of the mailing room is actually about three feet higher than the floor on the Lafayette side of the building to allow trucks to pull up at the loading dock and papers to be loaded directly into the truck beds. Um, this did make renovations and design pretty interesting because there's a line that you couldn't really cross with those three feet. Um, so we had to kind of work around that, which just made the first floor layout um, and tenant division kind of interesting to work through. In 1924, the mailing room handled 200,000 copies of the Detroit Free Press Daily and 275,000 copies of the Sunday edition. Um, the condition in 2017 is on the left and the lower right. And then we have a bird's eye view of the mailing room in 1924 on the upper right. Then the advertising room um, was one of the other main rooms on the first floor. It's also known as the public relations office and was located adjacent to the main lobby toward Washington Boulevard. This is where want ads and subscriptions were received. And it originally had a large wood paneled and marble wraparound desk, the location of which can still be seen in the floor from the marble border and the change in materials from marble to concrete. The upper walls has seven murals depicting the history of Detroit and the history of um, printing. Three of those murals remain today. Um, and then a portrait of Benjamin Franklin was located over the door behind the large central desk. As a new employee in 1977, I got a write-up in the company magazine, Column 9. I mentioned that I played bluegrass guitar. Shortly after the magazine appeared, a painter on the building maintenance staff stopped by my desk, introduced himself, and said he was a banjo player, and invited me to jam with him and a couple of his colleagues on the mezzanine. I had no idea the building had a mezzanine. For many months thereafter, I spent a happy lunch hour playing music with my new friends amid the equipment and supplies on the mezzanine, between the first and second floors from Marty Cohn. Um, so you have the floor plan with the approximate location of the jamming area there in orange um, and photos at, on the top of the mezzanine from 2017. The mezzanine was actually largely removed as part of renovations um, because it was no longer needed for equipment storage and the floor to ceiling height was so short that it wasn't usable for pretty much anything other than storage. In 1977, I returned to the Free Press from a year-long sabbatical. Having given away my furniture before I left, I had only my sleeping bag and a card table. One day, 
Kurt called me back to his glass walled office at the back of the newsroom. I sat down in front of his desk and Kurt sat back in his chair with his hands steepled in front of him. It has come to my attention that you are sleeping on the floor, he said. Free press reporters do not sleep on the floor. He leaned forward and dropped a white legal size envelope on his desk directly in front of me. Here's a check, go buy yourself a bed. I took the envelope, walked out of the newsroom and down the street to where Hudson still offered all the amenities of an old fashioned department store. I went to the furniture department, told the salesperson I wanted to buy a brass bed and picked out one from the catalog he offered me. I have it still from Dolly Katz. Um, and just a few photos here of the second floor and the condition that we found it in in 2017. It was a weird and wonderful place. Disneyland had nothing on the freep of the 70s from Eric Sharp. Um, the circulation department was located on the second floor and this area included the clerical and accounting offices. Had the largest want ad order boards in the world when it was built in 1924. And the want ad order boards included 42 telephone, telephone positions for handling incoming and outgoing want ad calls. So the map in the lower middle shows the original location of the circulation department on the second floor. Um, upper left photo is the condition in 2017. And then the up, rest of the photos are all historic photos with the upper middle, um, the circulation manager's office in 1924. Upper right is the clerical and accounting offices. And then the lower left shows the want ad order boards um, from 1924. Then there was Bigfoot, a very tall guy who would come up to the newsroom and just stare at people. I think he used the men's bathroom. It was a different world then. The security in the guard, the security guard in the lobby didn't stop him from Kathy Warbelow. Um, just a few more pictures of the second floor uh, before and afters. We have the second floor in 2017 and the condition when we first went in the building there on the upper right. And then two photos of the second floor cleaned out um, with a new core and new windows, just waiting build out from a future office tenant on the left. Uh, moving up to the third floor, the, uh, which was largely occupied by the composing room, the original footprint in orange is on the map in the lower right corner. Um, the composing room included the ad corner, which set 5,000 columns of advertisements into type each month. It also contained 42 linotype machines with room to expand and add an additional 28 machines. Um, the floor in that area was made of curlite wooden blocks set in concrete. And the upper photos show the ad corner and linotype machines in 1924. And then the lower photos show the condition of the composing room in 2017. Um, and you can see the wood block floor in the lower left photo, which after significant water damage had these massive multiple foot high um, buckles. Those are probably two to three feet at least high. Uh, they're pretty incredible to see in person. I used to go home some days just exhausted from laughing from Kathy Warbler. Um, and then the third floor newsroom. Um, over the many years I worked at 321 West Lafayette, I sometimes took friends and family members to the third floor newsroom. They were always surprised. My dad worked for Detroit Edison for 40 years. One day we walked through the newsroom, stopping to chat with a few people, including one reporter in a Harley Davidson t-shirt and cowboy boots who was eating a sandwich with his feet on his desk. As we left, I asked my dad what he thought. He said, it's sure different than Edison. The newsroom, also called the city room, city desk, and metro desk over the years, was a combination of office, clubhouse, and workshop. It was occupied from about 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day. It had a funky, messy feel. Newspapers and reporters' books and documents were scattered about. There was no dress code. Some people looked like bankers. Others looked like it was their day off. The behavior code was elastic, especially in the 20th, 20th century, accommodating profanity, drinking, and loud talk. Given that the business of the office was covering news, the tension of what will happen next, combined with reporters coming and going and hammering out stories on deadline, created a high energy ambiance from Bill McGraw. Um, the photo on the upper left is of the city newsroom in 1924 with the city newsroom in 2017 on the lower right and the composing room in 2017 on the lower left. 
Um, the newsroom has been home to a number of Jewish writers over the years as well, including Mitch Album, uh, Neil Rubin, Michelle Kaufman, Susan Goldberg, and Ellen Goodman, among many others. And then a couple additional memories um, from times in the newsroom. The year of the first marathon, when my job was to coordinate the race, Lad Newman forgot to get the bridge to sign the contract, and three weeks before the race, with close to 3,000 runners coming to Detroit, many who used the race to qualify for Boston, Lad informed me the bridge was out. M Molly McDonald. When I arrived in Sh Shine's office to be interviewed, I noticed a big banner across the huge third floor space that read one last asshole in the newsroom. I asked Shine about it. He replied, Ralph Orr had a colostomy. Kathy Ward below. Um, and photos of the composing room in 2017 on the upper left and then 2021 on the lower right on um, just waiting for tenant to Um, On the seventh floor, there was a test kitchen where recipes for the newspaper's food section would be tested before being published. Um, so we have a photo of what I believe was the test kitchen on the left there from 2017, and then a memory from Mary Ann George. In the 1980s, the tower kitchen, the test kitchen for the large food section, was a wonderful place. In the morning, the aroma of food being tested would waft through the stairwells. Then the word would go out that it was lunchtime, and Nettie Duffield needed volunteers to test the delicious dish dishes. She was never at a loss for volunteers. It was not only a great meal of sometimes exotic dishes, but a great time to hang out and laugh with other fruitsters. Nettie was a legend for her style, humor, and skill as a chef. She was one of my favorite fruitsters from Mary Ann George. Um, and then just looking at a few photos of typical upper floors um, from 2017, these, ones are, these photos are from the ninth floor. Um, on one of the upper floors, possibly the ninth, was the large, well-appointed office of the home decker writer. For some reason, she had her own office, and it was as big as the publishers. She was a genteel, gray-haired woman who retired at what I thought was a ripe old age, and then went on to a decades-long and highly successful career as a mystery novelist. She wrote a series of books about a cat who solved mysteries. Her name was Lillian Jackson Braun from Marty Cohn. Um, then the seventh floor roof deck. So the building has two large roof decks at the seventh floor level where the transition happens in floor plan from the E-shape to a single central tower. One of the roof decks is used primarily for mechanical equipment. Um, and the other was converted into an occupiable roof deck complete with an in-ground pool and fire pits for the building's residents. Um, so we have some before and after photos here of the roof deck on, on the top and some views of the new pool on the bottom. And then a few roof deck and pool facts. Um, the roof deck is a raised pedestal paver system that sits directly on the roof membrane. Um, the rooftop pool is actually considered in ground since the top of the pool is level with the roof deck. Um, the pool was sized and located between structural columns in order to avoid significantly affecting the building structure. Um, and the sixth floor is, was actually tall enough that we were able to have units in the wing below the pool. Uh, the pool itself has an 8,600 gallon capacity and a surface area of 336 feet. And the roof deck offers fantastic views down Washington Boulevard and toward Windsor. And just a few additional photos um, before and after of the roof deck area with the roof in 2017 on the left then the roof deck in 2021 in the middle, um, and then just a couple of photos of the community room that was built right off the roof deck. Um, it's kind of like a lounge in 2021 there on the right. And one of the significant historic features of the building was the upper floor corridors. Um, the original newspaper floors, the second and third floors, did not have distinctive corridors. However, the upper floors, floors four through 13, had decorative corridors with multiple significant features. Um, these features included the drinking fountains um, shown on the upper left, which were salvaged and reinstalled, the terrazzo floors on the lower left, which were refinished, 
where corridors um, were lengthened in some places due to the new residential use, the extension was stained and polished to be comparable with the original terrazzo floors uh, without appearing falsely historic. On the lower right, uh, it shows the marble wainscoting. The marble was removed due to asbestos containment and was replaced with a combination of thin tile that matched the original coloring and graining and a thicker marble base that matched the original marble. And these two different materials were used to capture the differences and thicknesses in the original design. Um, the original wainscoting was about a quarter inch crowd of the plaster walls above and the base projected beyond um, the marble wainscoting. Using two different materials also allowed the design team to recreate a small but significant detail in the corridors, uh, the plinth at each door, which was where the marble was slightly proud of both the door frames and the adjacent marble base. Uh, that's shown in the lower right there. And then the doors on the upper right were um, a single glass panel. Um, so our new doors are a single recessed panel with framing to match the original frames. And I'm kind of looking again at a typical corridor. The photos show the before and after of the elevator corridor on the eighth floor with 2017 on the left and the 2021 rehabilitation on the right. The widow of a man who had died was not pleased with his cremation. The complaint was that the ashes had a lot of chunks of them and they wanted satisfaction. She delivered the small cardboard box to someone in the newsroom and there it sat on the city editor's desk until someone slipped a cigarette partway under the lid. Someone else added a scarf. There might have even been a hat. Land Newman carelessly lifted the lid a bit one day and got ashes on his morning donut from Kathy Warblow. Um, and then another before and after of the typical corridors, this time of an elevator bank on the fifth floor with the 2017 condition on the left and the 2021 condition on the right after rehab. Um, then before and after of a typical corridor, this one on the 11th floor, um, again 2017 on the left and 2021 rehab condition on the right. Um, and you can kind of see in the right photo at the very end of the corridor how the um, flooring changes a little bit. That's where this corridor had been extended um, to accommodate the new residential use and that's where that's a piece of polished concrete instead of terrazzo um, at the end. And um, then looking at the fifth floor, we have some before and after photos um, on the top with 2017 on the left and then photo inside one of the units from that same view um, in 2021 on the right. I remember the visit once of Bill Clinton to the building and staffers peering from open doors lining the fifth floor hallway. Other times on opening day, the sign out blackboard could be telling, sick grandmother called half my colleagues out of the office. Coincidentally, our grannies often needed caregiving on St. Patrick's Day too. Fifth floor was my world, so there was seldom cause to roam around the building, but there were occasional forays to three for the newsroom, four for admin, or eight for the test kitchen. The press galley off the lobby was our popular lunch spot for takeout. From the rooftop were million dollar views of downtown Detroit, the Detroit River and beyond to Canada. Oh, for those days back from Rick Silving. And um, then a couple more before and after photos here of the same view um, on the 13th floor from 2017 and um, that same two windows from 2021, um, which is now a living room for an apartment. Um, there's a few final photos here of a residential unit um, with the kitchen on the left, a view of the living room and the feature wall on the upper right and the bathroom on the lower right. Um, and a couple additional photos of just various units throughout the building um, after renovation. Um, and then wrapping, coming close to wrapping up here on the 14th floor. The 14th floor was originally half building equipment and half um, radio equipment. 
Uh, it turns out there was a second unofficial music room on the 14th floor, the floor above the last elevator stop in the tower. You had to walk up a flight of stairs to get to it. It served for years as the rock and roll band room, rehearsal room for the Free Press Bulldogs, named for the short-lived Bulldog edition of the Free Press. So putting out a daily newspaper wasn't the only creative outlet at 321 West Lafayette from Marty Combe. So we have a plan on the left um, that shows the band practice room area in orange. A um, couple of photos of the condition in 2017 at the top and then at the bottom, the 14th floor in 2017 after all the walls and equipment had been cleared out. And then we have a few images of the 14th floor today, which serves as tenant amenities, including a conference room, workspace, and a gym. Um, we did actually cut skylights into the roof to allow for more natural lights since the original windows, which can be seen in the lower right photo here, are pretty high up and also quite tiny. So they really don't let a lot of natural light into the space. Okay. Um, and that concludes our tour. So hope you enjoyed um, learning about how people's experiences and memories help to color the history and the architecture um, of buildings. Um, hopefully this ties together the history of the building experiences during renovation and stories from former employees that has helped to add some character to the story of this building, which is continuing to evolve today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I am going to uh, open up the chat. We've already had some questions and comments come through. So I'll just get started with those. Um, the first was a comment. It said, coincidentally, last week, the Albert Kahn Legacy Society sponsored a webinar on the Guardians of Detroit about architectural sculpture on Kahn designed buildings in Detroit, including the Free Press building, uh, the David Metzger B. Arch at the U of M in 1968 as well. Very cool. I think I heard about that, actually. I recall hearing about that. And then uh, the first question is, was the constructor structure sound after 90 years? Yes. Um, actually, they hold up really great. Um, we tend to see, I think the issues we see, like we really don't have to do a lot of extra structural support or anything. Um, we will start to see the metal pans on um, starting to have some rusting in areas just from water damage usually. Um, but it, yeah, it's usually like that's not an issue that, or not an area that we run into issues with. Um, uh, another question was who owned the free press in 1924? Do you, do you know that? I don't know off the top of my head, no. Okay, that's something we can do some more research on. Yeah. Um, did you have any issues with the Department of Interior on, on uh, any part of your renovation? <laughs> um, not issues specifically. So this was a historic tax credit project. Um, so we worked really closely with the State Historic Preservation Office and National Park Service um, to make sure that everything we were doing would meet the standards and ultimately when the project is complete, um, tax credits. End goal. So there's always issues that you end up running into um, where you kind of need a judgment call. And so we always work really closely with them on those items. Um, the tearing down the marble in the corridors and replacing that was a bit of a sticky situation that's not generally allowed to be done. However, because of the residential use and it's actually unusual to find asbestos um, in the glue and in the walls that the marble is on, you typically find it in ceilings, um, not walls as much. Um, so because of all of those reasons, and because we were able to find such a good match for the marble, um, they were okay with it. But that did require quite a bit of back and forth uh, coordination with the State Historic Preservation Officer. Mm -hmm. Laura, excuse me, could you, um, could we see you please? Your, oh. your slides are still on. Can you see me now? Sorry, I can see me. I didn't know you couldn't see me. I, I can see her as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. 
Um, do all functionally obsolete old office buildings lend themselves to residential conversions? And what are the considerations you look at when looking at those old office buildings and making those decisions? Yeah, um, they they do tend to lend themselves very well to residential conversion. Um, a lot of it honestly comes down to the new owner and what they are looking for in their building portfolio, what um, pro forma works for them, what kind of rent they can get for different uses um, based on how much they paid for the building and what like profit they need to get. So a lot of that actually comes from the client more than from us. Um, however, we do, we will do studies um, and a lot of it will be kind of seeing what we can fit for apartments um, and how many units, what sizes, what types. And then the client will tend to use that um, information to decide whether or not the project is actually feasible. Is there any additional support for the pool and what is under the pool? <laughs> um, yes and yes. <laughs> um, there, we had to um, shore up the columns. So there's actually not as much additional support as you might expect, um, but the columns are right at the corners of the pool and then believe like one bay out on all sides, essentially, we had to add extra steel around those columns um, in order to support the extra load on the building. And then there's a pretty intense uh, steel beam structure kind of outlining the pool that um, is what supports the pool itself um, within the building and that those loads tie back to the columns essentially. Um, then under the pool is actually residential units. Um, the sixth floor is much taller. I wanna say it was about 14 or 15 feet. Um, it was much taller than the other floors. Originally it had a whole piping system in the upper ceiling. Um, which was part of that additional height. At one point, the building was actually designed that the E-shaped floors could be added onto as well, um, which that clearly never panned out, but that was a thought in the design. So the sixth floor is actually much taller. So we had enough height to sink a pool, have the structure under the pool, and still have regular um, apartments underneath with, I think, eight to nine foot ceilings. Just a reminder to everyone, if there are any additional uh, questions, please submit them via the chat feature. And we did have a couple comments come through. Uh, one is that the Fort Shelby, originally the pick Fort Shelby across the street was also converted to a hotel and condos. And another comment came through that there is um, a big Jewish connection to the building as well uh, with the Hanabing Law Firm and Herschel and Fink who became a free press employee. Um, and there are a lot of fascinating First Amendment cases there. And again, if anybody has any more questions, um, I'll give another minute for you to submit them via the chat feature. All right, well, I am not seeing anything else come through. Laura, thank you so much for a really fascinating look into this renovation and its importance in the community and to those who have been there and been with the building throughout its history. Um, we really appreciate you being with us here tonight. And to all of you who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you again very soon at one of our upcoming programs. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks again, Laura. Thank you.